Orion, welcome to Beyond the Inbox. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Can you describe the mission behind Black Travel Box and how a trip to Japan led to its formation? Yes. So Black Travel Box is a personal care products company for travelers of color. And really the core of what we're doing is enabling travelers to work and feel their best on the go, which feels like very, you know, beauty, et cetera. But it's really important because travel is a, is a main form of self-care, particularly for Black folks in America. So we love to travel and use it as a way to unwind, to reconnect with ourselves, um, to really rejuvenate. So that's kind of the goal of Black Travel Box is to help people really enjoy that experience every, every step of the way. Um, and that actually did come from going to a trip to Japan. And normally I have a whole bunch of hair out. It's, it's hiding today because it's rainy. But I was going, I went on a trip to Japan. I had naturally curly hair. I had a whole hair care regimen ready to go. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I did my wash and go before I left. I knew I was going to have to refresh it about mid-trip. And then by the end of the trip, I'd have a dirty bun and I, it would all work out. Except once I got there, it was beautiful it was springtime in Tokyo, um, you know, cherry blossoms, very mild weather. We decided to hop over to Okinawa, which I did not know, although it was only 45 minutes flight, was just kind of the armpit of Hades in terms of how hot and humid it was. And so as soon as I knew it was going to be a problem, as soon as they opened the airplane door and the, that feeling of I needed a shower immediately hit me. And my skin was sweaty, my scalp was sweaty, and my hair was full frizz and not in a cute way. And it kind of ruined the trip for me because I had one little bottle of conditioner with me thinking that I was going to be in a very mild weather situation. Um, and in taking the time to look around the island, I was like, okay, I get that this is a different demographic, but I couldn't find any products that works for me, even on the American uh, army bases that were there in the commissaries. And so that was really a tipping point for me to say, there's got to be something better. There's got to be something available to us widely that we can either bring with ourselves or we can find anywhere um, to just kind of be able to be there for, for the job, the journey, as opposed to running around looking for hair care products and skincare products. What was the next step after having that realization? Uh, I had a lot of sake. Um, no. <laughs> it was, um, you know, it, it was, it was a combination. So to be fair, like a lot of people like to say, oh, and then I immediately came home and I worked on it. I didn't. I took a lot of time of like complaining about this at brunch to my friend and going, didn't you ever notice this? And somebody needs to do something about it. And it took about six months. And finally, someone told me like, are you going to do something? And I'm like, you know, I think, okay. And I sat down. And I totally love to Benjamin button my way through things, but I sat down and incorporated the company. <laughs> and so I went online. I live in Colorado in the U.S. and like, I, it's really easy to do. So I sat down, thought up a name for the LLC and created it and kind of thought, you know, the government knows my name now, so I really have to kind of work on it. And that began the journey for me. And that was the start of what does this brand, what does this business really need to mean? Um, and I always start with, you know, brand foundations and build up from there. What was the process like for developing your products? And how did you decide on the specific ingredients and formulations? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so best laid plan. I, in my mind, was going to uh, go out and find funding and get a manufacturer to partner with me and we would co-develop a product and with that i brought together um i wanted to do some consumer insights work around understanding what products people really were having a challenge with and then like what's important to them right because you could you could be looking for efficacy you could be looking for ingredients you might want it to be sustainable you might want it to be i don't know gluten-free whatever it might be your thing and so I kind of in parallel went after those things. I started looking for funding. I started looking for manufacturing partners. And on the consumer side, it's very expensive to do proper consumer insights work, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I did not have that in my pocket. So what I decided to do was start with some really basic formulations, which 
you know, God bless the internet. There's a lot of great information out there. I do have a science background. However, there's a lot of great information and a lot of great starter recipes, for lack of a better term. And so you can get those from manufacturers of ingredients. You can get those in cosmetic making groups. People do this, you know, as a hobby. And so that was really my starting point to begin to play with some prototype product, just so I'd have something to put in front of people and get that feedback for making the real thing. I was researching for this episode and I read about some of your experiences with investors. And I wanted to ask you to talk about some of the challenges mm-hmm. you faced as a black female entrepreneur in the travel industry and how you've overcome those challenges. Yeah, so um, fundamentally, I would say until a lot has changed since I started. So I started in 2017. Um, what a difference uh, COVID makes. But um, one of the biggest challenges was we don't typically see Black people in the travel industry. We're not reflected there. So when I would go into rooms and talk to investors, they'd be like, but Black people don't travel. That's like saying people with red hair don't travel. It's like, unless you, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's one of those things that it, it's understandable that you don't, that you don't know that or you, that you wouldn't make the assumption only because we're not actually reflected in any of the advertising, any of the, the conversation around travel and many of the influencers, which have now like they've created a whole coalition around this. People who were creating content weren't being paid for it and all kinds of stuff. So that was uh, a primary hurdle. I think the secondary hurdle was people really felt uncomfortable with our target audience. Um, I'm a career brand manager and brand strategist. If you take away sort of the race aspect, the ethnicity aspect, anytime that you're looking at a marketplace where the usage occasion of the product is growing exponentially and is into the billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, the consumer you want to go after spends outspends every other consumer that participates in the category and they're willing to pay more if you talk to them that's a good that's a pretty solid market to go after once we start talking about things like race then it becomes a i don't really know this feels really small or it's gone as far as to say you know it seems a little racist that you're only focusing on and so those were some interesting challenges to, to kind of navigate through. Um, and I think the third thing really was, you know, having done this as a career, having at that point done it for 13, 15 years or so at, at the point that I'm getting in front of folks and being told, you know, you really need to lead with your resume so people will listen to you um, in a five minute pitch. I don't know how many pitch competition. You see, but normally you lead with the problem, right? And you talk about the solution and all of that. And so that was a little jarring and a little bit weird for me. Um, I was, I assumed that, you know, it's, it's um, entrepreneurship, it's meritocracy, but it is not. (laughs) I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the brand and the products. You've described Black Travel Box in several other interviews as a way meets glossier for Black travelers. I love that description. Tell me more about it. Yes, yes. It's a little squirrely because I know a way had some issues and I don't know how popular glossier is anymore. But um, the whole idea was a way as a brand. And for those who don't know, a way is a luggage brand. It came out, I want to say, seven, eight years ago. It's a really uh, immersive travel brand. So it's a very functional product, but a very immersive travel brand. It's all about the travel lifestyle. Glossier on the other side is very much about beauty, holistic beauty, very clear, very clean, very transparent. One of those things that um, it is sort of the go-to for all of your, your cosmetic essentials, primarily in the makeup and the skincare area. So the idea was, you know, sort of that visceral feeling of, Okay, I get what Glossier is. I get what Away is. And all of these are wrapped together. The brand and the ethos around beauty is really very squarely in that place of clean, transparent, effective, good stuff. And on the other side, we are very much anchored in the travel lifestyle and really want to continue to build out there as sort of a a brand context. 
you mentioned a little earlier on about COVID and I had in my notes here, I wanted to ask you about how you adapted to the changing landscape of travel during that time. <laughs> um, it was not even a changing landscape. It was a 90% drop in site activity and, and visitors in a week. Like it was gone. Um, and so there's a couple things that I did. I had a good cry. It just is what it is. <laughs> Always help. And then I, um, <laughs> I took about a month to just not try to gramble and do something, but to take a step back and make a really important choice, which was, do I pivot a business that nobody knows about yet? Right? So if you're fledgling and you're just starting a brand and you're really trying to establish what that core of that brand is, you know, pivoting it can fundamentally change what your brand is. So what happens when COVID's over? And we didn't know how long it was going to be. Most of us thought, oh, it's going to be a few months. But even a few months can be really stressful when you're trying to launch something. My plan was to launch in April of 2020. Oh, my. So it was it was a really important decision. And I actually started to look to some of the local businesses that were making pivots. So for instance, there was a bakery in I think San Francisco that nobody's walking out to the bakery because nobody could leave. It was a stay at home order. So what they did was they took their ingredients and made at home baking kits and delivered those to people. Like, you know, there are ways to stay at the core. It's all about beautiful artisanally baked bread, but now they've kind of changed that delivery system. And so I really kind of thought through those things and said, well, what can I do for Black Travel Box? And there was two core things that I wanted to do. One, I wanted to stay anchored in travel. So I created a staycation collection. So instead of vacating, you can't go out, bring the vacation to you. And these were products that really, I mean, there were candles. I was burning candles the entirety of COVID. And it was one of those things that it was like, this is a very easy thing. People are at home. You can create a new sort of ambience and atmosphere. But at the same time, when you think black travel box, you think travel. This is a London fog candle. This is a Riviera Bordeaux candle. Like it's meant to take you somewhere else um, sort of mentally. And so that was the first piece. And then the second piece was, again, thinking about that core of the brand in the wellness of the black community and things like that. I wanted to do a give back program. So we had a lot of people with um, that were first line workers washing their hands constantly, wearing masks, chapped lips. So we took our body balm and our lip balm and made it a bundle and created a COVID kit that was a donation item. So every person that purchased one, we would donate it out to a first line worker. And then we would also donate 20 percent of the proceeds. And so those were two ways that we really stayed core to what the belief and the values of the brand are, as well as still taking the same positioning, but kind of delivering a little bit differently. I love that. I love hearing how you pivoted during such a difficult time for so many businesses. And I'm curious, this is a good lead in for my next question. I wanted to ask you about your background in consumer good brands. I know you have a background with working with Kraft and Nestle. And I'm curious, how did working for those brands influence your approach to building and growing Black Travel Box? Oh my gosh. Um, so many ways. And I think I, I really do believe things happen for a reason because in the brand management world, there are a lot of different types of brand manager roles. Sometimes people just focus on the marketing. Sometimes they just focus on the in-store activation. Working at Kraft in particular, I had full ownership of all of those things. It was sort of a 360 ownership of the brand. So you essentially get a crash course in entrepreneurship, but you have a rich uncle who funds everything. <laughs> you just have to keep doing presentations to him. Um, and so for me, that was really helpful. I had a deep knowledge of operations and I had been afforded the opportunity to do a lot of really rich operation stuff while I was at Kraft, which was pretty unique with it, even in the marketing role. Um, I had a deep understanding of, of, you know, advertising, although we had worked with agencies. So even some of my experience later when I was working with, say, you know, Hasbro and Backflip Studios, I was sitting next to somebody who was buying ads. I'd never seen a person buy an ad before in my life. He had a credit card and was doing the whole thing. And so these experiences I was able to build and draw from, 
I think the core of it, though, is we have such a strong brand and brand resonance with the consumer because I was trained to do that well. And not because I am the consumer, because when you're when you're at a CPG company, you could be selling something that you would never, never buy just on your own. And you have to learn how to step into the consumer's lifestyle perspective and understand them sort of from the inside out so that you can deliver something to them. And so that skill set has been really helpful. Black people are all the same. So I had to learn who my consumer was and really understand what she needed. I love that. I love hearing the founder story and I love hearing about these inflection points along the way. I have another one here for you. I want to ask you about yeah. Beyonce. Tell me about you landing on this curated list uh, of Black-owned beauty brands. <laughs> you want to talk about my best friend? Oh my gosh, she's on tour right now. We FaceTime. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so a couple years ago, she launched... Um, the Black Parade route on her website. So basically what she wanted to do was do a give back to the community. Um, There's a lot of tumultuousness going on in the U.S. And um, she had just dropped an album. And this is a great way to promote it, by the way. But she had this landing page that she worked with Serena Akers to curate um, brands in the beauty space, in the arts, all kinds of like Black-owned businesses. And I had no idea this was going down. Let's start with that. So I'm getting text messages and I'm thinking like it's like a Nigerian prince in my Instagram trying to get me to send him a thousand dollars because people were like, click here. Oh, my God, I can't believe this. And I don't I'm like, yeah, whatever. It wasn't until someone I know personally texted me and said, wow, this is amazing. Like Beyonce featured you that I was like. (laughs) And I went and looked at the link. And we were one of the first 12 beauty brands um, on her site. And the funny thing is, is they didn't use a product image. My face is on there. So if you guys go to Beyonce.com and look on the Black Parade route, my face is on there. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fantastic. And it was um, really, it was a surprise. And it was something that, you know, when we talk about like the mechanics of, you know, marketing and all of that stuff, I had to quickly start setting up stuff on the back end because I was like, we're getting traffic. Like this is, this is huge. So it was really cool. What are some of the ways that you capitalized on that referral traffic? Yeah. Um, I mean, number one, the, well, the traffic itself, it was, how do we make sure that everything that we're using to identify traffic has essentially the UTM parameters? Like it understands where that traffic is coming. So everything from our pop-ups Our pop-ups on our site, I created some specifically for the Beyonce fans. So it had little bees and I was like, hey, Beehive, thanks for joining us. If you don't know me, this is who we are. Here's a special discount for you. Sign up for our email list on the back end. All of those folks that came through that form were flagged. So we know within our, you know, our CRM that who those people are and we can always come back to them and know, like, This is a perfect time. She just launched her um, European world tour. We can email the people that we know are Beyonce fans and say, oh, my gosh, she's on world tour. Did you travel to it? And oh, by the way, you know, here's a special discount to celebrate that. Um, So it really is about using all the ways in which you can identify and flag and tag that traffic so that you can contextualize your messages to them. Such a creative way to capitalize on something like that. I love that. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about what are some of the effective marketing strategies that you've used to promote the brand? What's working right now? Yeah, I mean, so (laughs) evidently people like me to talk about the business. It's (laughs) as a a quasi introvert, it's a weird thing for me. Um, but we have some ads running and the ones that do the best are the ones where I'm essentially pitching what it is that we're doing and explaining the products and talking about the challenges of our consumer. So you can make some great, you know, little video snippets and static things, but people really want to hear from the brand owner, like what that vision was and why we exist. Um, that makes me super nervous, but because I know I need to make more videos. But yeah, that's that's really what's working. The other thing is, is when we talk about like organic, some of the things that have gone more viral for us have really been around education 
in the travel lifestyle and practical ways of making travel easier, which is so in line with what we're doing. Like we're doing that from a personal care standpoint and, you know, in the future, probably from a numerous uh, touch points. But that is something that really resonates where we will get massive virality because people are like, oh, wow, how did you pack that? Oh, wow. What was that thing that you used? So that's another way in that we found has been really valuable. And again, now it's about creating a content engine that, that cranks out more of that. It's so interesting hearing about your experiences with being the face of the brand and having this almost reluctance to making videos. It's something that so many founders talk about. And yet being the face yeah. of the brand is the best decision that you can make. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that I think it really depends on the mix of what you have going. Um, you know, I, I ran legacy businesses that nobody had any clue who was running, nor did they care. I was the person when I started at Craft that I thought the Keebler elves made the cookies. Like I was like, you've got these little cartoon guys, they're, they're the cookie guys, right? Never knowing that there was a whole engine behind it. And so I think that I was just talking with someone recently, we were talking about being an introvert as an entrepreneur and what does that look like in being the face of the brand. And at the end of the day, I think, I think your mental health comes first. So it's one of those things where you pick and choose where you show up and understand what it is that your consumers are actually looking for. Like it may be that your face just needs to be on the package, but you don't have to be doing videos and interacting with them all the time. If that's the thing that stresses you out. The thing that's particularly interesting and pertinent for our consumer is she has a history of being sort of um, set up by brands who are like, we made this for you. We put a gold ribbon on it. We said a drop of shea butter is in it and we made it for you. But it was really selling to her, not for her. It wasn't created for her. And so their thing is, is this actually a black owned business? Is this actually somebody who gets me? Or is this kind of like, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a setup? And so for me, even we'll even see this in our ads where people will ask those questions in the comments. So they just want to know that I'm a human being that exists, that looks like them, just so that they can have that reassurance. And so that tells me as long as I've done enough pieces of content or gone live or gone into podcasts, these things will live in perpetuity. And these are things that we can share and kind of bring that social proof that I'm not a random white dude in his mom's basement. Sorry, random white dudes in your mom's basement. <laughs> but that's not the person to sell her hair care product. So, yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I'm curious, how are you communicating that you are who you are throughout your marketing. I'm going through your funnel right now and I'm getting your emails. And I did want to ask you about how you're using email in terms of regular emails and workflows. Yeah, so I'm going to preface this with, I've been sucking with campaign, like the one-off campaigns lately, um, just because I've had a little bit of distraction and I'm still a solopreneur. But um, our drip campaign, baby. Our flows, baby, I think they're just, they're great. Um, unless you found something that's broken, you just tell me separately. But um, the thing for me is you, I think that I actually really prefer that to campaigns because campaigns can be very um, timely, right? So someone just run March Madness. You want to shoot them out a quick email that's like March Madness themed, it's basketball themed. That's really interesting. Beyonce just went to Europe. That's a one-off email. So those are great to show that you're you're relevant and you can get that open in the inbox because it makes a lot of sense. It's like, oh, Beyonce, yes, I want to see this. Um, but when you do sort of these drip campaigns and you've got these flows going, it's a great opportunity to take people through the courtship of becoming a you know a, a customer. And once they become a customer, it's like going on a date. You get the first kiss, you don't ghost them. You gotta, you gotta chat a little. You gotta keep talking. You gotta keep it interesting, right? And so what you'll see through our campaigns are, you know, the basics, things like acknowledging that you're new, welcoming you to the brand, inviting you to understand the product, but it also invites you to understand me and my founder story. And then it starts to dig deeper into, um, you know, if we think about the, the the structure of the brand, the benefits of the brand itself, 
the reasons to believe the brand, you know, delivers on those. And then individually, we start with our um, best selling products and we start to talk about what's the benefit of this product and the reasons to believe around it, ways to use it. And then we kind of work our way through products, bring people back around to social so that we have a little bit of variety in the way that we're talking to them. But that campaign, that initial welcome flow, I think we have about a dozen emails in it at this point, and it takes them maybe a couple months out. With that, they then switch over based off of their purchase behavior um, and you know their, their email opening behavior and things like that. They may go into like a longer nurture sequence. They may go into some post-purchase stuff. And then we try to do some annual things like telling people, it's your birthday. We're glad you're still here. Hey. And here's a discount. Treat yourself. So that's the kind of ways that did I like to approach um, email. I love everything you've said about building trust. And I wanted to ask you a question about the product. I did a lot of research for this episode and I read in one article, this blew me away. Quote, black women use more beauty products per capita than any other demographic and face many health disparities, including the highest breast cancer mortality rate of any racial or ethnic group in the United States, end quote. So I want to ask you, can you speak to the importance of creating clean and safe products and how you ensure that Black Travel Box meets those standards? Yes. Um, I, think we, I think we proverbially know that you know, clean beauty is important. And if any of us have had a person close to us who's ever had cancer or fibroids or any types of diseases that are sort of like, clearly there's maybe some environmental factors involved, you start to become very keenly aware about what you're putting in your armpits, what you're putting on your skin. Your skin is the largest organ in the body, um, you know, what you're exposing yourself to. And in the U.S., we found that there was a massive disparity. There was a research study done, I want to say in 2018, that looked at what well, oh, at the ethnic aisle, which is the separate aisle where most beauty products marketed to black women um, are, it was over 53%, 55% of those products had really danger dangerous chemicals in them. And many of them, like 75% of them, didn't even actually have those on the label. So there's one thing to pick up a product and look at the label and go, oh, that is a very long word that I don't know and I'm not sure what it is, so I won't buy it. It's a very different thing to take it home and use it and not know that those caustic chemicals are in there. Lots of things that are hormone disrupting and that kind of thing. So for me, there was no way that I was about to tell my community that I'm here for your wellness, your emotional self-care, and then kill you with a chemical. Like that's just not going to happen. That said, I am a firm believer that not everything with a chemical name, because by the way, everything on the planet has a chemical name. Everything. You break down eggs, they have chemical names for all of the ingredients. Like, that's just the nature of chemistry. The physics people will yell at me, but everything is chemistry. Um, so it's really about understanding what research is out there, what we know about particular ingredients, and balancing efficacy with relative harm. So every ingredient that goes into our products, I'm looking at both the amount of that ingredient that's going in as well as i mean i read the sds sheet for everything um, which is basically the safety data sheets that you get for ingredients that go into you know products the other thing that i do is i try to look at eu standards and understand why the eu is maybe banning certain things because the eu is way more stringent than the u.s let's just be clear the eu is way more stringent so i look at their standards and try to understand what's driving that. And oftentimes I will reject ingredients based off of that as well. So much more to unpack, but we're soon coming to the end of the show. I wanted to ask you about some exciting developments or plans you have for the brand in the near future. Oh my gosh. Um, this year is exciting and scary as all heck. Um, we are going into some hotels. We're partnering with a startup in the hotel space. Um, we're still working on that contract and that deal, but I'm very excited about that. We're also having some active conversations with a major global hotel. Um, so that's that's proceeding as well. It takes time to get those things together, but I'm really excited to be able to have products at the point of need. So when people show up places after TSA has taken all of their things, you know, and they're like, what am I supposed to do? Now I got to go out and find it and having that option in room and having that option in the sundry shop. So 
that's a big push that we have going right now. We launched an I Fund Women campaign, so we're raising fundraising for that. Um, like I said earlier, it's it's been a challenge having fundraising conversations. So this has been a primarily bootstrap business, and um, we're using our community and our crowd funding as an opportunity to grow and scale. And um, we're going from there. I, I really look at this as an opportunity, um, particularly with hotels, to get hundreds of thousands of people to try us and get paid to do it. So <laughs> it's going to be fun. I'm excited. I love that. I didn't think of that. And I can see so many people benefiting from having it in the hotel room. So I think that's wonderful. My last question for you, Orion, is where can our listeners go to learn more about Black Travel Box and support your mission? Sure. Yeah, you guys can find us online at www.blacktravelbox.com on all social channels at Black Travel Box. Um, I'm a big fan. If you're a business owner, get your name on every single platform, even if you don't use it. Our primary platform is Instagram uh, and Facebook. And if you want to find me, I'm Orion, O-R-I-O-N underscore Helana, H-E-L-A-N-A. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Perfect. Well, we'll put those links in the show notes. And Orion, I want to thank you again for taking the time to join us. I really enjoyed this conversation and researching for this episode. And I want to say all the best in future with Black Travel Box. Thank you. I appreciate you having me.